Welcome to the Laverne Church of the Brethren's weekly audio message. Here at the Laverne Church of the Brethren, we create a Christian community called by Christ to be inclusive, caring, and peace-minded. We affirm that people of any race, ethnic identity, gender identity, sexual orientation, ability, age, economic status, faith tradition, or life situation are welcome in our congregation. We believe in compassionate service, stewardship of creation, respect for diversity, and nonviolent reconciliation for differences among all people, nations, and faith traditions. We claim no creed but the New Testament as exemplified by the life of Christ. We strive to follow the way of Jesus. And through these efforts, we seek to grow ever closer to the mind and heart of God. And now let us ground ourselves as we enter into today's message. Those of us who may have entered into this congregation with no sense of the liturgical calendar might be thinking, Pentecost? What is Pentecost exactly, and why do we celebrate it? Some call it the birthday of the church. It's often described as the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Situated in the biblical narrative, the miracle of Pentecost comes after Jesus has lived his subversive life, was crucified by the powers that be, rose three days later, and ascended to heaven. Yet the wonders of God continue. On Pentecost, followers of Christ are gathered in Jerusalem, along with many other Jews, as they celebrated the Festival of Weeks, a remembrance and celebration of when God gave the Israelites the gift of the Torah. As many gathered for this special time, something out of the ordinary happened. We heard it in our first scripture today. A rushing sound of wind filled a home where the followers of Christ gathered. Tongues of fire rested on this gathered people, and they began to speak in languages unknown to them. Words foreign to them were understood by others in Jerusalem. The text doesn't tell us exactly what they said. My guess is that their words had to do with the radical love of Christ. And this is the story of Pentecost, a mysterious day where something seemingly magical occurred in an upper room during an ancient time. The celebration of Pentecost is often confined to this tongues of fire moment at the beginning of Acts. Yet a clear break in the Pentecost miracle story isn't apparent until Acts chapter 3, when the biblical writer shifts into a new story with the phrase, one day. So what happens after the tongues of fire, the rushing wind, the languages? What more is there of this Pentecost story? Well, we hear speeches from Peter reminding his audience that the prophet Joel had described an occasion such as this, that God's spirit would be poured out onto everyone. After Peter's words, many are baptized and form a truly caring and compassionate community. So while this dramatic initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit contains miraculous signs of fire, wind, languages, it's entertaining and all. What I find even more fascinating and outrageous is in the second Acts reading today, the continuation of the Pentecost miracle, the radical community the Spirit sparked. I'm drawn to the power of the Holy Spirit in this diverse community that is formed. They eat together, worship together, they share what they have, meet tangible needs. Their hearts are glad and generous. They sell all their possessions and do distribute the proceeds to those who are in need. If that's not an outrageous miracle, I'm not sure what is. Their goal is the goodwill of the people. Their lives and service were not confined to the temple building, but flowed out into the messy world in which they lived. It's no surprise then that this community grew quickly. 
The last verse describing this Pentecost community reads, day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Saved. In religious context, I find the word saved to be cringeworthy. When I hear the word saved, I'm transported back in time into awkward and severely shy junior high Amanda, sitting among 500 other junior high students in my mega church's midweek youth group gathering. I can hear the pastor's altar call to be saved, the push to go through the step-by-step process to make sure I'm right with God. And I'm reminded of the many times I walked up the packed church aisles with guitars strumming softly in the background to the front of the stage to solidify my salvation with an adult leader. I said the prayer and I completed the steps. And though I hold immense gratitude for my junior high evangelical church, who first introduced me to the expansive love of God, to the life of Jesus, I no longer hold on to those step-by-step tenets of salvation that prompted fear and guilt from me so often. While this Pentecost community inspires and enlivens me, the word saved came back to haunt me. Though in studying this word saved, I found a new understanding to this usually disturbing word. When I looked at the Greek word for saved, I found that it had several meanings. To save, to bring safely, restore to health. Often the word saved is interchanged in scripture with get this, healed or to be made well. In scripture, the word heal is often synonymous with save. So when Jesus saves, he heals. He makes things well. We might reimagine this spirit-filled community of faith not going door to door to hand out tracts to save people and ensure their entrance to heaven beyond this world. Instead, we might understand them to share healing and wellness with the world. We might reimagine the text to say this. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were brought to safety. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being restored to health. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being healed. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being made well. We can still debate, though. Is this salvation one of an individual soul healing, wellness, and safety? Or is this spirit-prompted salvation one of justice, communal healing, wellness, and safety? Some say to connect salvation to social justice is Satan's work, and that true salvation is between God and individual, while others say to focus inward is just plain selfish. I see both in scripture. I find soul wellness in Acts 8 when Philip introduces an Ethiopian Ethiopian eunuch to Jesus. After the eunuch is baptized, he goes away rejoicing, an example of deep soul wellness. I see community wellness through justice work found all throughout Acts. Food and possessions are shared, needs are met. Immediately following the miracle of Pentecost, Peter and John heal a man who cannot walk. They provided health care for someone in need an example of engaging in community wellness. A few years ago, as part of our church's ongoing effort to become an anti-racist congregation, we hosted a workshop called Witnessing Whiteness, where outside professionals in anti-racism sought to educate members of this church body to further the work of dismantling racism in ourselves, in our churches, and our communities. It was in this workshop that I was given a gift, the gift of and. Yes, the gift of the word and. And maybe you've already unwrapped the gift of and. Maybe she brings you joy with her endless possibilities. Maybe this gift is new for you. Allow me to introduce the gift of and to you now. 
Often I can hold two seemingly opposite statements in my mind at one time. Here's a quick example. I want to go to the beach, always. I have a lot of work to do, also always. <laughs> I tend to join these statements with the word but. I want to go to the beach, but I have a lot of work to do. When I say that, my body becomes stressed. I get like a sick and sad feeling in my stomach. The word, the word but signifies to me that I'm definitely not going to make it to the beach. When I replace it with the word and, it sounds like this. I want to go to the beach and I have a lot of work to do. I can feel a shift in my body. I kind of lighten up when I use the word and. I can see things differently. I can formulate a plan. I'll, I'll push through this work and then I'll go to the beach. I can hold these two statements together. The gift of and isn't reserved for ways to get us to the beach. Let me make that clear. <laughs> As I learned in witnessing whiteness, the gift of and can help me process through seemingly opposing statements about racism as well. Here's another example. I try my best not to be racist. What I am hearing is that racism is everywhere, even in me. When I join these two statements with the word but, it sounds like this. I try my best not to be racist, but what I'm learning is that racism is everywhere, even in me. Sounds depressing. Like I tried, but oh well, racism wins with and. I try my best not to be racist, and what I'm learning is that racism is everywhere, even in me. In our congregation's exploration of racism in our church and community, another and statement might sound like this. Our congregation strives to be anti-racist, and we exist in a community with a long history of segregation and exclusion. And can hold two seemingly opposing statements together. I can try my best not to be racist and still know that racism is everywhere, even inside of me. And our congregation can work at being collectively anti, an anti-racist community and understand the unsettling history of the community in which our congregation comes from. Both and. The shift between but and and opens up a world of possibilities. To me, and is life-giving. So which type of salvation is spurred by the miracle of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost? Was it a personal wellness or a community wellness? Let's try and on for size. Spirit-filled Christ followers led people to the divine love of God in such a way that their souls were made well, and they healed people in the physicality of now, through food, through community, through care. Both. And. Perhaps salvation is a wellness of our individual souls when we're grounded in the life-changing love of the divine. And perhaps salvation takes place in community when we work towards safety for all, provide health care for everyone, share food with every aching belly, and care for each person's well-being. The miracle of Pentecost was in the rush of wind, the fiery tongues, the understanding of distant languages, and it was in the witness of God's people, in the radical generosity of Christ's community of faith, the distribution of wealth to those in need, the breaking of bread, prayer, the care for all. Friends, I invite you to take the gift of and with you today. Try her on for size. May we be a people who allow and to shape how we live out the Spirit's work of salvation, of wellness, of healing in our lives, our church, our community, and the world. Amen. We're so glad that you listened to the message today. 
If you're looking for an open and affirming, peace-loving, and justice-seeking congregation, consider visiting us for in-person worship on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. We'd love to meet you.